The goal of this video is to start from Maxwell's equations in the time domain and then move them to the frequency domain using a concept called phasers, which is basically a Fourier transform in disguise. So let's start by writing down Maxwell's equations in the time domain. They obviously involve an electric field, E, which can in general be a function of the spatial coordinates and the temporal coordinates. And it turns out that the curl of this electric field is proportional to the time derivative of the magnetic field. The magnetic field, which again can depend on R and T, so its time derivative is proportional to the curl, and the proportionality constant is minus mu, which could also depend on the spatial coordinate. There's of course a sister equation here, which relates the curl of the magnetic field to the time derivative of the electric field, and there we have epsilon as a proportionality constant, the permittivity, and then time derivative dE r dt. Okay, obviously we write this down in the absence of any sources, and we're also going to assume that both epsilon and mu are scalars, so we're working in isotropic media. So these things are true for general, arbitrary, exotic time dependences. What we're now going to do is we're going to restrict our time dependence to a purely harmonic uh, oscillatory behavior. So we're going to do that by fixing the frequency of that behavior. And then we're going to say that all our fields vary with that particular frequency. So if we focus, for example, on the X component of the electric field, in terms of its dependence on the temporal coordinates, we're going to say that this is an oscillation with a certain amplitude, and that amplitude, we're going to say that this is EX0. The amplitude can, of course, still depend on the spatial coordinates, but in terms of temporal behavior, we're going to say, by definition, that this is going to be a cosine omega t plus a certain phase, phase of the X component of the electric field, which could still vary as a function of the spatial coordinates. So by convention, we're going to restrict our temporal dependence of our fields to something that looks like this. And obviously, we can do something similar for the Y and the Z components of the electric field. So in essence, what describes this oscillation is a certain amplitude and a certain phase. Now, obviously, if you encounter an amplitude and a phase in the wild, then your natural instinct would be to try and combine those in a complex number. And that complex number is exactly what that phasor is. A phasor, and I'm going to write that as EX with a tilde. This phasor, this complex number, uh, which can still be a function of the spatial coordinates, but no longer of the temporal coordinates, is basically this complex number is basically formed by combining the amplitude and the phase. So it's a complex number with amplitude EX0 as a function of R and the phase is uh, given by this guy over here. So that's the definition of our phaser. So this is how we go from the time domain, if you want, to this sort of like pseudo frequency domain. The question is, if I give you a certain complex number, if I give you a phaser, how do you go back to an explicit temporal dependence? So pause the video and see if you can figure this out for yourself. Okay, so if I give you a complex number, E tilde of R, and I'm going to drop, drop the subscript uh, X here to make our life a little bit easier. How do we go from this phasor to the time domain? Well, the trick turns out to be to multiply this with exponential J omega T, and then with the resulting expression taking the real part. Is that indeed correct? Well, let's see what that is, because we know what our phasor is. Our phasor has a certain amplitude. Um, E0 as a function of R, it also has a certain phase, okay, like so. And then we multiply that phasor by exponential j omega t, and we take the real part. So this combines to, gives the, to give the exponential j um, phi plus omega t. Now exponential uh, of j something 
thanks to Euler, we know that this is the cosine of that something plus j, the sine of that something. So if we take the real part, we only recover the cosine, the, the sine drops out. So finally, this becomes E naught of R cosine omega t plus phi, which is indeed what we were after, because this is the time dependence that we started from. So this is how you go back from the frequency domain to the time domain, multiply by exponential j omega t, and then take um, the real part. Now, for some inexplicable reason, some people prefer actually a minus j omega t as a time dependence, which then results in a different time dependence here. Um, so yeah, obviously nobody is perfect, right? No, but in all seriousness, it's just a convention. Uh, but be aware of the fact that some people use different conventions for their time dependence here, and that will result in some minus signs popping up in unexpected places in some formulas. So be aware of the fact that different people can choose different uh, conventions. Good, so now we've introduced the phaser. We know how to go back and forth between representation in the phaser domain and representations in the time domain. What we still need to do, if we go back to our Maxwell's equations over here, um, we have a time derivative. So the question is, how do we translate that time derivative from the time domain to the frequency domain? So pause the video here, calculate explicitly the time derivative of that expression and try and figure out what the complex number, what the phasor is that you can associate with that, uh, that time dependence such that you recover it using this formula. So pause the video and have a go here. Let's first explicitly calculate the time dependence. So if we have d e d t, and I'm going to omit the spatial dependence here, make our life a bit easier. So if we have e, so where would we have our time dependence? If we have e cosine omega t plus phi, if we take the time derivative that becomes minus sine, so we have minus e naught sine um, with an extra omega, of course, sine omega t plus phi. So this is the uh, explicit time dependence when we take the derivative. The question is, what is the complex phasor that we can associate with that? Um, and I'm telling you that the way we get there is taking our original phasor, E tilde, and multiplying it by J omega. Why is that the case? Well, we can easily check that for ourselves. If that's true, then we should be able to recover the time dependence using our trusted formula, right? And the trusted formula is taking the uh, real part of the phasor multiplied by exponential j omega t. Now the phasor, we propose that it's j omega, our original phasor. And then if we multiply that by exponential j omega t, and we take the real part, then we should recover that expression up here. Let's verify that that's indeed the case, uh, because we do know what our phasor looks uh, like, right? We, we know what uh, E tilde is. E tilde is E naught exponential j phi. And then we just add exponential j omega t. And that becomes the real part, j omega. Let me just do that explicitly here. So exponential j something is cosine something plus j sine something. So cosine something omega t plus phi plus j sine omega t plus phi. Okay, cool. And now we need to take the real part. Now, thanks to this j here, what we need to look at is this term j times j is minus 1, so we end up with minus omega epsilon naught sine omega t plus phi, which is indeed what we were after. We were trying to recover this particular form here. So this shows us that time derivatives can be replaced by multiplications by j omega in the phasor uh, domain. So what we're also going to do from now on is rather than writing e tilde, is we're just going to uh, 
get rid of that tilde and the context will make it clear whether we're talking about the time domain or the, the phaser uh, domain. And we're also going to collect all the different components of the electric and the magnetic field. So here originally we started by looking at the X component. It will do something similar for the Y and the, the Z component so that we can collect them in a complex vector if you want. Okay, so that's just some notational housekeeping uh, for the future. What we can now do in a final, very easy, trivial step is pause the video and write down Maxwell's equations in the phaser domain. So that's pretty easy. That's just replacing DDT by multiplication by J omega. So we end up with the curl of the electric field, which is function of the spatial coordinates, but no longer of the temporal coordinate, right? That was the whole point, getting rid of the time dependence. And then in terms of time derivative, we multiply by J omega. So minus J omega mu of R H. And then similarly, we have the curl of the magnetic field, J omega epsilon R E of R. And these are the famous curl equations of Maxwell in the phasor domain, in the frequency domain.